play. And another, another foul on Ward. His third for setting a screen. He's such a physical play, although George Taylor just got caught with a moving screen. Pick and roll. And a foul. Offensive foul coming up again. Battle box getting it right there. So Welcome back, everyone, to another edition of The Moving Screen. It is Sunday, January 20th. I'm Brendan Quinn with The Athletic, here with Dylan Burkhart of umhoops.com. Long weekend on the road. We are both dragging here. I I don't even have my phone muted. Uh, There we go. uh, It was a long stretch. I was just uh, in Lincoln and then in uh, Madison, where I caught up with, with Dylan. Uh, for uh, two big road games, and we flew back together. It was you and I in the same row, along with a, a new friend we made. Yeah. We, <laughs> well, luckily, we didn't record the podcast in the plane, but uh, now we're here, and we're ready to uh, break down some of this eventful weekend of yeah, hoops. It would have been a nice touch, I think, if we had just recorded it right right then and there, man. Some Every, peanuts, well, everyone some sitting podcasts. around us would have loved it, too. I think they could have chimed in, though. If I know their hoops out there. They do. Well, but should we get into... Uh... I guess that's what the people came for here. So uh, let's. we're, we're going to start with Michigan uh, losing its first game of the year. Uh, that's probably... It's certainly the, the most newsworthy thing here. Um, especially, you know, I mean, that's, a, it's, that's national news. It's a... A team that was lined up would have been number one, potentially, and potentially, mm-hmm. but I not, think probably most likely. Um, but all the unbeaten's are uh, were vanquished, and that's taken care of. So um, a loss was inevitable. They were not going to go undefeated. It was more if than, or was more when than if. So, what were your initial thoughts, uh, good and bad, on a? Uh, on the day that was on Saturday in uh, in Madison, I think a lot of that game went almost exactly how you would expect it to go, as far as the style of play, what each team tried to do, how each team defended the other team. Everything was basically vintage Michigan Wisconsin game. We've seen that script before, and it just boils down to Michigan players being able to make plays in the spots that Wisconsin forces you to do so and they just couldn't get that done in the second half and the offense just fell flat that's probably where I would start um I kind of saw this one coming I know we talked about it last week on the pod but it's just a tough spot if you can't have someone to create points on their own against the Wisconsin defense because they're good enough to take everything else away and Michigan just couldn't find that option on Saturday. Yeah, and it was one thing to struggle with the scoring, but the turnovers were just brutal. Um, I mean, by by program standards, it was historically bad. Only the fifth time uh, since, like, 2010. I forget what, exactly what the stat was. 2010-11 or something like that. Only the fifth time with 24% or more turnovers um, on their possessions. Like, yeah. You're not. You're never going to be perfect against Wisconsin, just because the way that they play is going to is so disruptive, and you're not going to be able to just run what you run or do what you do. And you, everyone's seen these games, so you kind of know what you're getting into. You, but you can't compound things by, by turning the ball over 16 times. Um, some were forced. There were four charges called. Um, other of it, other instances were just guys trying to either do too much. We're not making decisions quickly enough, um, but some of them were key. They were they were really really key. Um, I'm thinking of that that one with with like a seven minutes left or so when like Xavier drove too deep on the baseline and they got they collapsed down and um, he he was stuck in a double team and kind of the ball came dislodged. He tried to force a pass out to Brasdakis out on the wing and ends up being a transition. They come down and hit a three, and I think it made it like. 48 44 and it was like every basket was so valuable in that game it was only 66 possessions and yeah you can't turn the ball over and it was you know 
I think John will probably be more upset about that than than anything, than the loss. You know, if they lost the game but still did what they do well, it might be all right. Yeah, I I think the turnovers boil down into a couple different categories. You have the charges, which is just something Wisconsin does an amazing job at. They've taken like three and a half charges per game, which is just a crazy stat if you think about it, especially with how slow they play. But then you also have, because Michigan had so much trouble scoring in the half court, Michigan really tried to push the ball yeah. in ways that they're not really used to. And a lot of that you get with like Isaiah Livers dribbling the ball in the open court. That's not really a great situation. And I know that's they're trying to basically cheat because they know that their half court mm-hmm. offense is really struggling to score. And then I like the play you were describing with Simpson, that kind of goes back to the point of what was really wrong with Michigan's offense. And that was they either couldn't get all the way to the rim. Mm hmm. And they were try- trying like hell to do that because they also couldn't shoot over Wisconsin. And they couldn't hit those little middle shots that Wisconsin is known for giving up. And they packed it in. There's no drop-off pass. There's not, there was not really any – Michigan's guards could not get drill penetration enough to score at the basket. And that led to kicking out to shooters who were struggling to shoot or just trying to do way too much. And I think that – frustration kind of just wore down at them offensively yeah i mean you can probably count on one hand the number of easy baskets that they got in that game there was the livers transition dunk there was um simpson on that back cut that pool found him on that that real nice pass but like it's literally i mean you can go through like the fact that you can remember them shows how how much of a struggle it was just to even get clean looks sometimes yeah, and, and in the first half michigan got a few of those rolls to the basket mm-hmm. um davis had a pair and uh John Teske got quite a few looks around in there. A lot of times he was getting fouled, which hurts because he didn't shoot all that well from the free throw line. But uh, when you can't, when you can take that away, and you can take the wings away, you basically have Xavier Simpson trying to his best to do something, or Jordan Poole trying to do something. Jordan Poole was shooting really well in the middle of the floor in the first half, and then the second half he ends up he kept he was trying to take it all the way to the basket and would get about. 80% of the way and kind of just throw some wild shot right. up, which just wasn't wasn't getting the job done. Um, and he was really, I think, the player who was going to be the key for Michigan um, in terms of his offensive production because he's your most he's the guy most likely to make those dynamic plays. And really, that's all that Michigan had going for it in the first half for totally. much of the time. Yeah, he went um, one for six in the second half, and that was really the you know they just didn't get the production that they got out of him in the in the first and. When so many of the time, it was him with the, with you know basically one on one play out top, just dribbling and jab stepping, trying to get some separation just to take a forced jumper. I mean that for the most part was you could probably there was probably ten possessions that that was what they got out of it. What do you, what do you make of uh, Ignas Brzezdekis taking a a zero and really his first big time Big Ten road game? Um, I. I don't think he's getting the ball. Um, first of all, it's not driving against oh, some of the defenders that he got let earlier in the year who really didn't, A, know that much about him, didn't really know his game. I think the film is out on him a little bit. It's easier to scout what he does. Um, he's not a natural enough shooter to warrant um Defend, you know, trying to prevent him from shooting. If anything, he can go and fire away off if he wants all day. But um, it, teams know, I think, how to how to play up in him a little bit when he does get the ball in his hands. And you know, he's going to have to figure out a way. And I don't know, you know, where his ball skills are right now to give him ball screens and let him get looks through those situations. I, I mean, you could probably speak to this better than me. But um, I, I'm not. I'm not sure how much of an option that is to install on January 20th. Yeah, and I think they've started to. You see a few sprinkles of that here and there. But the problem with him in the ball screen is a ball screen so dangerous because you can shoot, pass, you can do all those things, and Iggy's not really finding guys out of that sort of look right now. Um, he's two of his last 16 from three-point range, yep. and that, I think, really kind of speaks to his 
dip in production where teams are realizing, yeah, we're, we'll give you that shot. Totally. And if he he makes two of them, all of a sudden he's got 30. But And then everything kind of gets going for him. But he's definitely has been scouted to a degree. And he the other problem is that everything he does is just derivative of the rest of the offense working. Mm-hmm. So if you want to sp- take your time and not tag off of him and the ball screen coverage, then – you can take him away because it's not necessarily action that's set up directly for him. It'll be interesting how he rebounds here, though. I mean, we've seen a lot of good young Michigan players go to the Cole Center and just put up a horrific performance sure. the first time. So I don't think you can read too much into it. But it will be interesting to see kind of where he goes from here. And if this is sort of like a little slump is it a little bit of a wall like he has not quite reached that same level he was at before Christmas and part of that is just he's a freshman in the grind of the Big Ten for the first time ever which isn't a small thing um I mean this is a dude who put 24 on North Carolina um like he's going to I think watching film is really going to help him and I think they really need to do a lot of probably individual work with him in the room on film, see exactly what looks he's getting, what looks he's not um, finding things like that. But you're right. I mean, he has to be a threat in some other ways to do some other things just to force the defense's hands in some way. He's got three assists in these, this five game stretch of big 10 play here. He's got three assists in, I would, you know, he's probably averaging whatever, 28 minutes or so a a game in that stretch. Um, It's a little bit of actually what you saw maybe from Jordan Poole and some of the time he came in last year. Um, when he didn't know how to create. Now, they're completely different players, but it's still that idea of seeing the floor and understanding what's going on in real time, right? Yep, and I think well, they really need shooting from that four spot. Yeah. Like, to that, if Livers, because Livers was one of three, and Iggy was 0 of three, and that without that spacing from the corner, it kind of just allows teams to completely collapse. Cause, sure. And... They get that more often than not, obviously. This is the first time it's really cost them. But it is interesting to kind of see that when Michigan loses, this is what it looks like, right? This is They lose with their offense struggling. I mean, their offense just – their defense maybe wasn't perfect but played well enough to win the game. Right. The game was lost in their inability to score. It was I think we looked it up yesterday. It was their worst offensive performance since that horrific game at South Carolina two years ago, Right. which – is a long time and speaks to how poorly the offense played. You know, and cre- a lot of credit to Wisconsin played well. Um, I thought the two keys of the game g- going into it, or at least what I tweeted, you know, basically right at tip off was you know, their, their big things were uh, avoiding an early foul on, um, on Teske and uh, not letting Wisconsin hit threes. Um, that was, you know, someone on the staff mentioned to me that that was kind of like their their number one thing that was um, identified coming into the game was you just look at look across the board their their worst games was when they only hit a handful of threes and, and you know a lot of that's eliminating a guy like Trice who as we've talked about on the pod a number of times he's kind of it's been oftentimes as he's gone they've gone but um, what they end up and they, what they end up getting yesterday. They hit five threes and they all felt fairly backbreaking. But and it is I that think it? it probably, they only hit five. They, it was probably especially frustrating because man, they did completely take Trice and Davison away offensively. They yeah, basically blanked them. But two guys off the bench, Kobe King and Aleem Ford, both hit a pair of threes, mm-hmm. and they were just sort of they kind of came out of actions where Michigan was maybe mismatched a little bit, and I some of those double team coverages or lack of double team coverages got lost in translation, and then mm-hmm. it's just a back-breaking shot. And, I mean, both of those guys can shoot. That's why they're in the game. So it's not like a guy hit a three who can never make a three. Those are – it's just – it was really, I think, breakdowns in communication. Yeah. And then just the ball goes in. Put it and, this way. they The five threes was there. One, two, third fewest, tied for their third fewest made this year. In the other games – uh, were a win against Stanford, a loss to Virginia, a loss to Minnesota, a loss to Marquette, and a win over Rutgers. 
Yeah, I and and yes, Ethan Happ had a great game. He got his points, but I thought he needed to work for them. He took a twenty-two shots. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought John Teske played another terrific game, really on both ends. Yep. And it's crazy to think that two years ago he couldn't even hang on the court against Happ, and now right. he basically went head to head for the whole game. Mm-hmm. And that I the fact that he could play in this game and he didn't commit his second foul until really the, like the very end of the game, I think it was. It's just insane to me to, for as disruptive as he was against a player as aggressive as Hap. I mean, Teske basically held Michigan's whole defense together in this game all around the basket. Right. So I thought it was an impressive – really, he's on a string of impressive games that are leaping off the page, I would say. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, really the only positive performances that you circle yesterday was – him and um, probably Xavier. I thought Xavier played a, a fairly decent game. He had some turnovers, but um, you know, three turnovers in 37 minutes against Wisconsin is not exactly an egregious thing. But um, he did get a couple baskets. He took 12 shots, and I think that's certainly speaking to you know teams are okay with Xavier Simpson getting 12 shots, right? As long as mm-hmm. it's you know they have, Matthews took five, Brasdakis took five. Um, Xavier Simpson should not be combined taking more shots than Charles Matthews and Ignis Brasdakis at any point. That should not happen. Yeah, and that's kind of when you end up where you're at. And that's really, I think, really the last three games we've seen teams make it a two-man game with Simpson and Teske and just try to take the wings away. That's what Illinois tried to do. That's what Northwestern has tried to do. And that's what Wisconsin did. And that speaks to basically how teams are going to defend Michigan right now. Last year at this point, it was, oh, everyone starts switching everything. How's Michigan going to react? This is going to be the same kind of thing. How do they get the wings more involved when teams don't tag off of them in the ball screen game and they mm-hmm. not, they're not going to give them spot up opportunities. That'll be well, let's see how Michigan adjusts. It might just be as simple as they hit a couple threes and like start spreading the floor out a little bit, but we'll see. And they don't have long no. to wait because they have Minnesota coming in on Tuesday night. They do. Um, let's hop over to that game. Ken Palm is projecting it as a 74-60 uh, win for Michigan, um, which is that's a pretty healthy number, 14 points. Um, pretty healthy but- number is what Minnesota lost by at Illinois. That's Minnesota. a healthy number. Oh, yeah. What was it 20 or 95-68? Yeah. That's, that's a loss for I, me right I, there. I saw the first half of that game and said, that's that's it for me. I don't I don't think I'm on board for the second half. It was terrible. Uh, can't, even, can't even get through 40 minutes of the fourth-place team in the conference. That's uh, Couldn't do it. That's tough. Couldn't do it. There was also golf coming on, though. Today's the watching some Desert Classic. Uh, it's good stuff. So, <laughs> um all right, Minnesota is obviously one of the flawed teams of the league. Um, they got a little Jekyll and Hyde to them, but more um, uh, of late, more more negative vibes around uh, that that team. Right. A loss, a ninety five sixty eight loss at Illinois is arguably one of the worst losses in the league for the season, um, and then came back and beat Penn State by one at home. At home, yeah. So uh, that's where Minnesota is. Um, what do you think about this matchup? It is a matchup that I feel like Michigan teams have usually done well against Minnesota teams under Patino. Um, True. Basically, you have a big athletic team that can't shoot and is really great at getting to the free throw line. Um, they're seventh or worse in all the four factors in the Big Ten, except they get – more foul shots than anyone else. Hmm. So they basically just bash the ball inside and draw fouls. But they are shooting 30% from three in Big Ten games, and they take 27% of their shots from three-point range. So they basically don't shoot. And obviously, as I would hope many of our listeners know, Michigan, year in and year out, is one of the best teams in the country at not fouling. They are... I think Wisconsin shot their first free throws in that game, like in the second half yesterday, or, Mm -hmm. yeah, yesterday. So Michigan, by definition, kind of takes some of that away, but you have to always wonder about 
Minnesota does have size. They have athletes. They have what you'd call raw talent. It's just I'm not sure it's enough to travel to Ann Arbor and really test Michigan. Well, this is the irony here being, of course, that Minnesota won at Wisconsin uh, two weeks ago or so. Um, mm-hmm. A really low-scoring game, if I remember. Yeah, 59-52. Um, yeah, I mean, that, and that's the thing, because they do have guys. You know, like Amir Coffey's a dude, a real dude. Um, and when they actually do make some shots, they can look pretty good. Um, you know, if a guy like McBriar's hitting, or McBriar, sorry, is, is hitting, or um, I would say Isaiah Washington, but uh, that is so rare that he actually makes any, any jumpers. Jelly <laughs> Fam. Doesn't even take them, really, I don't think. Jelly Fam did play the game of his life. At Michigan last year, if you remember, uh, I'm trying. He, to, I'm trying to remember now. I think it was a, it was a, it was actually a very close game, and he was just hitting mid range jumper after mid range jumper. It went to overtime. Um, oh, he had 26 on 10 for 14 twos. Yeah, he was just he just hit every floater in the book, <laughs> and that was a test that Michigan probably a uh, Michigan was probably a close to a double digit favorite in that game and barely survived in overtime. So I guess you can see that, I guess you would call those some East Coast buckets that they gave him last year. Um, I don't really think, I don't know. You, we'll think, have to, you, like, think, Xavier, you think Xavier throws him in the uh, body bag or what? Well, sometimes he doesn't even really play that much. So it's all, you don't really know. Right. He He's not really a consist, he, consistent threat. I think what's going to be interesting is Amir Coffee is kind of, all over the map in terms of his production consistency. He uh, plays heavy minutes all the time, but he can go from 29 points at Rutgers to nine points at Illinois on two of 13 shooting. So you don't really ever know what you're going to get with him. Um, Charles Matthews, probably a decent matchup there, but Charles Matthews hasn't been all that consistent lately either. No, he hasn't. And a guy like uh, of, all the things going on with Michigan right now, um, the the how to get Charles Matthews um, going again has to be pretty high on that list. I would I would think. Um, what do you think is the best way to do that, Dylan? <sighs> not play Big Ten road games for some reason. Charles <laughs> okay. Matthews just is not good in Big Ten games. Okay. He's been great in like neutral court events. He's mm-hmm. been great in. Non-conference games, and if you look at his Big Ten numbers over the last year and a half, they're just awful. And he just has not been able to produce consistently. I'm not sure what, like, we've seen him produce against good teams. It's just finding that consistency, especially on the road, he has not been able to get to. Um, He's doing all sorts of, he's just doing way too much when he tries to get to the basket. And he seems like he makes every attempt within six feet of the rim more complicated than it has to be. He's either turning around and fading away from four feet or he's doing an extra up and under or just he just it's just kind of stuck in that zone. And I don't know it's a confidence thing for him, I think, but I don't know what the solution is. Do you have any uh thoughts there? I don't I mean it's um sometimes he he's a guy who like it's Sometimes you just kind of have to take it, you know, like the shots don't fall when he gets in and he does those little triple pivot, try to get position and lean in and, and flip it up. Like that's probably a 50, 50 shot half the time. So if you're going to, if that's a good look, then you're going to have to live with the fact that there's going to be games where those misses are going to pile up. Um, you know, they're not going to change. They're not going to become a different team that suddenly gets a guy like him out in transition running or, you know what I mean? Like there's not. There's not going to be any kind of special sauce. I think he's just got to kind of figure figure it out, you know, play yeah. a more efficient game. Maybe maybe there's a couple that he doesn't have to force um, here or there. Sometimes he can still get eyes on the rim, I think, and almost forget that he has the option of, of passing. Um, and he can get into that spin cycle thing down there. And, you know, it's kind of a toss-up. But it, sometimes he gets something and sometimes it looks terrible. Um, it's hard. And but, sometimes he has moves that – make him look like a pro and he what? it's just finding that every time and it's sort of like 
tuning a like high performance vehicle, right? Like it, if you get it just right, like I would say Michigan got it just right in the NCAA tournament last year, and then all of a sudden he was great. But they sort of had to break it down and build it up to get to that point, and it seems like they're kind of in that zone again right now. Yeah, he's 24 for 56. Uh, that's 40, 43% on twos in Big Ten games. Yeah, I wrote an article last week, and this was before the Wisconsin game, but he was 0 of 24 on mid-range jumpers in wow. Big Ten games, wow. which is almost impossible to do. But uh, he did hit one of those from the elbow at Wisconsin, so... Well, right now in league play, regression toward the mean is inevitable. Right now in league play, he's shooting the same on twos as he is on threes. So, take that for what it's worth. Um, So Minnesota, uh, I know I don't know how much we're going to break this thing down. Um, They can be a hard team to watch sometimes. Um, I'm trying to think of any numbers of note that you want to throw out there. They're giving up almost 70 points a game uh, in league play right now. And for a Michigan team that um, scoring hasn't or didn't come easy for them this week, I think they might be chopping at the bit to get out there. They're going to be pissed, for one, um, and a, a lot of guys are going to get back on track. So I think overall um, we can probably leave Michigan with this conversation. I, look, the whole the whole shiny out, outlook of like a loss is good, um, I think a loss is good. I think this team kind of needed to see itself in a different light. I think they were uh, not not overly um, confident, but I think they were starting to smell themselves just a little bit. You got Brozdakis out there saying they want to play Duke. <laughs> now, apparently got goaded into the question a little bit. I don't know. I wasn't there. I was on the road with Michigan State, but um, I think a little humility, a little smack is probably good for these guys. There. And we said it early in the year. Um, anyone that listens, like this team is at its best when they are angry and they play and they take it personally, um, because still it's at its core, a team that can play really good defense and turn that really good defense into offense. Like that's still right now, the recipe for this team to win, not going out and scoring 80 points. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't really buy into the whole loss is good or isn't Mm -hmm. good narrative. I mean, it's more the bottom line is that they're trying to win the Big Ten regular season sure. and they have more road games and more what Ken Palm calls tier A games than anyone else they're chasing right now. And they're now a game behind Michigan State and a half game behind Maryland. Mm-hmm. That's the simple fact of it. And yeah, if it's going to propel you, well, they're just going to be playing basically, other than this Minnesota game, they're in a dogfight almost every game the rest sure. of the way. Sure. So. And it's not. I don't. I just don't buy into all those narratives. They just each. each it's just a game. They lost the top twenty road game against a good team. Agreed. It happens. I mean, Agreed. I think we should move on to Michigan State and flip this around because they won a road game they at did. a top twenty team and were impressive. Yeah, I mean, they just kind of keep getting the job done, just game in and game out. Um, they look. They can win ugly. They can win pretty. You know, they are they're the kind of uh, they've got a lot of good good stuff going for them right now. And uh, I love the way that they're playing. That was a really impressive win at Nebraska. Nebraska um, was terrible, but um, I think a lot of what they why they looked so bad. A lot of it, you know, should be credit to Michigan State um, in in a number of ways. So that game. Um, you know, they never, the uh, pinnacle was f- filled to the ceiling and they tried a couple times to get the place juiced up and then every single time State had an answer and Cassius Winston was again um, outstanding, 29 points, I think it was a career high, um, three of seven threes, six of eight twos, uh, six assists, four turnovers, did everything, made every big basket, um, really bounced back from a rough game at Penn State. Um, when I think people were, it was almost like they were like disappointed in him and he's got this, yeah, I think he, he does understand the fact that like, if he plays poorly, they might lose. Like that's really what it comes down to at this point. Like if he just has a trash game or if he isn't especially locked in, they're at risk to lose on any given night. And that's a lot to ask out of a guy, but, um, 
he is what makes them go. So, um, just a great performance from him. Nick Ward again. Uh, he had 15. He's averaging almost 20 points a game now in Big Ten play. Um, they're really they're going. What do you think? I, I'm not sure. I've seen someone just get destroyed in a one-on-one point guard <laughs> matchup as badly as it's Glenn Winston Watson just destroyed Glenn Watson. <laughs> yeah. From the opening, I mean that was just a dominant performance, and it was get out of my league. Isn't yeah. it was just awful. I mean yeah. Watson had to get benched. And then he got a couple baskets against Foster Lawyer, and then Winston just dominated him both sides of the floor. Very impressive performance, um, and the kind of thing that's going to make him more and more the favorite for Big Ten Player of the Year. Definitely. I mean, that's on the road, and just and Glenn Watson's a senior. I was just disappointed in that as just a fan of good basketball. It's sure. Like, come on now, you gotta. He was all amped up. Finished three of thirteen. One assist, two turnovers. Winston, twenty nine points, six assists. Yeah, and that and Watson, really was if, if you wear different. purple shoes, you better ball out. What do you got against purple shoes? I, I mean, if you're wearing a red and white uniform and you throw some purple shoes on, you better be uh, the star of the game. I'm just saying that. But and then the other guy for Nebraska, James Palmer, you know, leading scorer, just gets shut down by Matt McQuaid, who just was was all up in him again. Same thing he did to, to Carson Edwards. He's got his hand all up in his face, um, plays right on his hip. You know, just annoys these guys. And that's the thing, like the, the frustration level that that Michigan State is able to put some opposing teams' best players at um, is the, the residuals that come from that are are are, are pretty significant. And, and Palmer scored um, the emptiest twenty four points. I think that you can pretty much ever see. Yeah, most of that came late and on the free line. throws and stuff like yeah. that. Um, he was Nebra- six for twenty-one from the field. Nebraska shot forty-two percent on twos, and Michigan State did a tremendous job defending the rim. But what's incredible about that is that on the year, teams are shooting forty point four percent against Michigan State on twos. It's the best in the wow. country, yeah. and all of a sudden. They're looking like a team with a defense that's as good as their offense. Um, their defensive efficiency in league games keeps creeping closer and closer to Michigan at the mm-hmm. top, and their offense is just in a different stratosphere, really, than any other Big Ten team. Um, they are, they look the part, and there's like we've talked all the time about when is Michigan going to lose? When's Michigan State going to lose a Big Ten game? Yep. You look at their schedule and. It's hard to say to pick a spot that's oh, much I, sooner than. I mean, I, well, their their next three game stretch is pretty significant here. I, I, they got Maryland at home on on Monday night. They go to Iowa. Quick t- turnaround on Thursday. Iowa, yeah, Iowa we, is we, a different team at home. It's a different team, and it's it's a tough place to play. Um, and then a road game at Purdue, which just backhanded. Um, yeah, this is a tough Indiana. week. Indiana, that's a that's a pretty significant week. And it's a three and six. And they'll probably be favored in all three, though. I, would. They've, I just think they've to see them win three of to win their last four with three of four on the road. That's impressive stuff. Without a starter and without a key bench player. And so, I mean, I don't know what you could really. They're locked in right now. They're mm-hmm. playing as well as they probably have in even at times last year. I mean, they look. The part and everyone, I think, is really comfortable in their role. Yes, um, we've seen Winston grow into more of an alpha when he doesn't have Langford next to him. And before, I feel like he would be an alpha on every third game because he could, but he could also kind of coast in the background of the game. Now he's the guy. He's playing 39 minutes, whether he's in shape enough to do it or not, and he's just getting the job done. I think that makes everyone else better on that team and even if the other three guys are mostly just there to catch and shoot open threes or Kenny Goins plays muck around in the mm-hmm. paint and get rebounds I mean they all buy into that role Matt McQuaid basically I, was just on the court to chase around James Palmer and he did it the whole game and looked absolutely gassed but that's how you win games and I I just love what Aaron Henry gives him 
do you think that did we, did we talk about it last week? Him, um, the idea that he. You think can, he's due can, for a big yeah, game? Yeah, I think he's going to. I think his his usage is actually going to start to spike here. I, I think they're going to look to get more out of him, and I think he's fully ready for it. Um, I just lo- love his athleticism. I love the way he runs the floor. You know, when they really get out and start to do that stuff with those quick buckets that they get. Um, when they advance the ball the way that they do, like he is just so tailor made for all of that because he's a great finisher. He's fearless. He's physical. He just attacks the rim. Um, he's really just a good, good fit there. And he had nine points, so he's getting closer to that that double digit. Double digit. <laughs> I still think that's got to be the strangest stat in in the country. He's a, he doesn't have double digits in the game yet. Um, but you just think of how good he's been. Um, but then, like, I, I also think how well Nick Ward has played is probably um, overlooked or underrated, however you want to uh, phrase it. But he's effective, uh, or he's, uh, like, his rebounding numbers, he's, like, top 10 in, in or top 5 in the league in a number of, of categories. Um, he's shooting 62% on twos um, in league play here. It's, he's just really turned into a reliable player. And uh, you know, says a lot for for where he's for where he's come from and how much he's grown. Yeah, all the all of his offensive numbers are basically on par with his career averages in terms of like the rate stats and all mm-hmm. that. But uh, what's changed is that he's playing more minutes, and he's playing more minutes because he has Izzo's trust because he's anchoring the defense and doing a good job of it mm-hmm. right now. I mean, right now Ward's playing sixty four percent of available minutes in Big Ten games. He was stuck around 50 in the last yeah. two years, and they haven't had any really defensive fall off, which is crazy to say when you're talking about losing Jaron Jackson. Yeah. But this defense looks almost as good as last year's. They're better field goal percentage defense, which is just crazy to think about when you consider they lost two pros that were elite athletes and all that. So I think Michigan State is not really – doesn't seem like people are quite talking about him a lot. Like yeah. uh, in terms of, they've been the best team in the Big Ten in Big Ten games by a, probably a pretty significant margin. They've already won a few road games. I mean, they're in a really good spot, and it'll be interesting to see. What I'm most curious about is how they reintegrate Josh Lankford when he comes back, yep, and totally. how that changes because they have a perfect blend right now, but you just don't know. I guess what that looks like in I guess we'll find out though. I mean, yeah, I sure. feel like that's coming soon enough and can't complain about really anything they're doing now. Um, look like the best team in the league. The, um, what do you think about my like Gabe Brown getting some, some big moments in the first half there, uh, at Nebraska. He had, uh, that great N one finish, um, took contact for a guy who, oh, let's let me see his numbers here. He has. I want to see how many twos he's taken. Six. That was his well in the in league play. It was his second two point shot attempt in Big Ten play. He was two for eleven on threes, uh, but he went in and uh, drew some contact. Had a nice finish. He had a big block. Um, that's something he you know he's kind of sometimes he falls into um, these stretches where he just only wants to stand and shoot threes, um, but. You know, he does have the athleticism to do all that stuff. And if Langford's not going to play, um, I do think that you know he's a guy who, who needs to take advantage of the minutes that are that are there for him. Um, I, I thought there was a, another positive step is it for a guy uh, to, to to see himself maybe a little bit differently. He's always ready to shoot. I'll give him that. Uh, that he's is- ready to pull at any <laughs> given moment. Shot ready. Um, It'll be interesting. I thought it, uh, Nebraska, I think people made a deal about how they're real versatile on the perimeter and they have kind of different switchable athletes and all that. They held up a little bit okay on the glass, but if you're going to play all these small guys and try to spread a team out, you have to be able to make a three. And right. Nebraska didn't even hit a three in the second half. And there's just, you can't open things up inside so instead they were left almost like how Michigan was in Wisconsin just driving into the teeth of it and not scoring 
Um, and that's exactly what Michigan State right. wants to do. Yeah, I mean, it was the second fewest points that Michigan State has scored this year. Um, holding Michigan State to 70s, pretty good. You know, I, most teams would take that any given night. But like you said, you know, now their defense is suddenly becoming the defense, and they just frustrated the hell out of a Nebraska team uh, that was not only playing at home where it had won 20 straight games, but um, also like it's got, it does have some guys who can go and score. Their offensive numbers don't um, jump off the page sometimes. Um, But, you know, they can, they got guys, they got dudes that everyone talking, you know, their starting lineup is um, at least. No, their starting lineup is is about as good as you'll see. Yeah, right. Um, So to hold them to 64 points at home is, Pretty good, pretty good. So, and now going forward, now I mean, we we talked about it a little bit there. This the week ahead, um, this Mar- this Maryland game is going to be really really interesting, and probably a game that uh, as of what back in de- early back in December, I don't think anyone would have circled as you know, man, this is going to be a, a premier early season Big Ten game. But here we are. Um, Everyone keeps Maryland trying to rolling, man. discount the Terps, and then they just went and won at Ohio State by yeah, the so-called 14 experts. on Friday night. What? I said the so-called experts. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, Anyone who's a long-term listener to the pod will, will get that. So, Seven Maryland wins for the Terps there. is interesting to me because they have two bigs, which matches up well against Michigan State. And then Cowan versus Winston is going to be a really high-level game. I just think back to they went to Breslin last year and just got run out of the gym. Yeah. And then I think the game in uh, College Park was a little closer later in the year. But I wonder about – it's still a young team. They've won on the road, but they haven't won on the road in a place like the Breslin. And I'm curious to see kind of where Maryland's at with this because the Breslin will be rocking and they match. I like it's a matchup that I think Michigan State will be comfortable with in a lot of ways. Yeah, it, it is interesting because Michigan State so rarely sees anyone that really mirrors them, and and here you are. So you know, Fernando versus Ward. Um, that's. That's must see TV right there. I mean, that they're they are two true big men who are different kinds of big men. Um, you know what I mean? And I, I know I'm looking forward to it. I'm assuming, you know, I, I, this could be a game where these two teams are f- pretty evenly matched. But I got to imagine Breslin is going to be lit. And uh, how have they done? What, let's look at uh, Maryland's road wins here. They've won at Navy. They've won at Rutgers, they've won at Minnesota, and they've won at Ohio State. Um, their lone road loss was a two-point loss to Purdue um, back in Where they early played fairly December. well and had a chance to win yeah. that game. Yeah. Um, so, man, it's a uh, Cowan versus Winston. You're on break, record break. as not a fan of Anthony Cowan. So. <laughs> which, is, which is not aging well. <laughs> he's, he's uh he's really been really been producing. He has uh if you just look at his last couple games here, uh where is it? Twenty against Ohio State, six assists. Uh he went for twenty one against Wisconsin, twenty four against Indiana, twenty seven against Minnesota, fifteen against Rutgers, nineteen against Nebraska. He's been balling. Pretty good he's... stretch, man. That's a pretty good stretch. He's made at least two threes. In every one of those games, um, he can get a little turnover prone, though. His turnovers, Their whole team can. True. But it, and you can't turn the ball over at Michigan State and give easy runouts. But Michigan State's also not a team that forces many turnovers. They play, they pack it in more, right? which could be interesting. They both are going to try to crash the offensive glass hard. And I don't know that either is... Like I feel like both teams are better offensive rebounding teams than defensive rebounding teams. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, Maryland is first in defensive rebounding, but uh, Michigan State in the Big Ten is 
ranked 11th in defensive rebounding rate, which is a little bit surprising to me, potentially because they go to block so many shots and things of that nature. But uh, if someone can get an advantage on the offensive glass or like really who can win that two bigs on two bigs matchup sort of sets the tone or Mm -hmm. is it just point guards dueling it out? I mean, it's it's a high level matchup and I just don't know how you can really go with Maryland when the game is played in East Lansing. Right. Um, This game presents an interesting uh, spot to have this conversation. Michigan State's minutes at the four. Um, Xavier Tillman gives them a very interesting look. Um, He he can bang. He really both of them do. Both of them play good defense. They really can can rebound. Um, sometimes it, it feels like if you're looking for, um, you know, Kenny Goins probably gives him a little bit better ball movement, I think. Um, I would consider him a better stretch to step out and hit one. Um, I know because Tillman made like two or three threes, people were like, eh, that's a good shot. I still think it's a bad shot, and I would let him do it all day long. Um, but... Um, what do you think? Do you think it's just matchup dependent, or do you think there's more value in either lineup? I think, first of all, what you'll see is um, if you're building a defensive game plan against Michigan State, and this is what Nebraska did, you're not defending Tillman or Goins True. at the three-point line. Right. Um, they're a combined four of 24 from three in Big Ten games. Kenny's so, also made one in each of the last three games. But he's three of sixteen. Mm-hmm. If Kenny Goins is going to shoot three or four threes on you, you're going to take that. It's sort of like sure. letting Xavier Simpson shoot, even sure. if he makes three threes in a game. Um, but what Goins well, in the last gives, three games he's not three of sixteen. The last three games he's three of eleven. But sorry. <laughs> if if what Goins gives you is defense rebounding, and yeah, I guess ball movement in the sense that the ball's never gonna stick there because he's not really going to do anything right. with it right and he, and he doesn't get the ball in really true post up spots or at least really tries it Tillman will still spin and put the ball and, and get try to get a guy on his back but sorry and ahead. I think some of that high low action that you can run mm-hmm. a little more versatile offense with Tillman I, I do think it's a matchup thing and you can't really downplay the defensive impact that those two guys have when you look at some of their two-point defense, all those defensive yep. numbers, they have to stem from the fact that they have all that size in there. And you can't downplay that. Even if they're Goins is a limited offensive player, He's the numbers on defense speak for him. He's playing a lot of minutes. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'll be interested to see more what happens with the minutes when you go to start getting guys back. Like, when Kyle Ahrens gets back, who that is playing a bigger role now kind of mm-hmm. shifts back. When Langford gets back, who shifts? You're going to have to choose where you want to distribute those minutes more. Well, now you're just kind of yeah. spreading everyone at a kind of healthy level. And it's slightly interesting that, that Kenny is probably a slightly better defensive rebounder, but Xavier is a slightly better offensive rebounder. Um and it's kind of what do you need at any given moment, I, I guess you could say. Um, but then also, yeah, who are they being matched up against? Because, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to think of exact um, examples of Kenny going against bigger, you know, true kind of old school power forwards who have, um, who have real length on him. Uh, nothing is jumping out in my mind. Lamar Stevens. Okay. That could be one. Um, I'm trying to think. I just... I wish I could think of one. But he's going, to, you know, he's going to guard a bigger guy in this game. A guy who can score over him. Yeah. I, I, if you're scoring over Michigan State inside, more power to you. and you're, Maybe you have a chance. But no one's really been able to do that. And I don't know that... You look at this game plan and you think we're going to jam it up inside and go right over the top of Kenny Goins. I think you think you have to spread out Michigan State first mm-hmm. and then attack off the dribble. But 
we'll see. I mean, Maryland's offense is unique in the sense that they are going to have sticks out there next to Fernando, and they can give you a bit of a different look. I don't. It just feels like you're trying too hard to beat Michigan State at its own game, though, which is mm-hmm. not really what I would call a recipe for success. All right, and it's really hard because if, if the other option is to get out and run and try to score easy baskets, well, you're probably going to lose that track meet too, you know? So um, that's why, I mean, this is exactly why Michigan State is really good. It, it, this conversation of just trying to find ways to beat them is growing increasingly uh, more difficult. So uh, I think I think Izzo's done a hell of a job. I think this roster has done a hell of a job. Um, but this is a three-game stretch that, will man I mean because if you look at at what's on the back end of this three game stretch like if Michigan State handles these three games that is a clear runaway path to a a second straight Big Ten championship yeah there's a lot of games in terms of in terms of being they'll be in the mix right but like if they get through these three then you get Indiana at home then you play Illinois Minnesota um, well, Wisconsin's looking. But in the last month, difficult. they still have to go to Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, mm. and play Michigan okay. again. That's a fair I point. I mean, the, there'll be turns, but if they make it through this, they're going to be in, I guess you can say, the driver's seat, right? Right. Like that's, 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 that would have been the, the proper way of saying that, yeah, because... Um, they don't go to Maryland. They don't, no. And just being able to kind of dictate what happens... Is is more so the uh, the situation that they would they would put themselves in there, but uh, for if you're curious, Ken Palm has them finishing seventeen and three in the league. Does that sound right to you? That's a high number. It's a high number. It is. I don't. I don't think it'll be seventeen that wins the league. I think it'll be more. I'd go sixteen, but we'll see. I mean, they've already won four road games in the league. Um. Hmm. And they're not going to lose many games at home, so I guess that really only means winning what four more road games, and then all of a sudden you're talking about a team that can finish seventeen and three. Right? If you say they could maybe drop one at home, I mean it's it's possible, and it's just so hard to know what you're going to get from any of these teams in the middle on any given day, right? Is is Purdue really good right now, or? Have they, have they figured something out, or are they just a product of a stretch of their schedule? And, you know, it's just hard to find the truth somewhere in the middle there. And, and we'll start to can, get more and more of a picture. But You can say that with we, so many teams in the league, too. That's that's sort of the issue, where it's right. hard to really rate these schedules because you don't know. Maryland could go and lose a few games in a row as their schedule gets tough, and it doesn't mean they're that much different, but it kind of changes the lens you look at everything mm-hmm. that's happened to this point. True. And uh, that we're going to use. Let's use that as the transition to our power rankings. Um, uh, first, real shakeup of the season. We have a new number one. Yeah, I, I, th- I think you have to put Michigan State at the number one spot. This, um, I think I picked uh, first this week. And uh, look, they're they're arrow, they are razor close. These two, and um, I mean, people can certainly make a case for either. Um, but if you're just saying, if the power ranking is who's playing the best right now this week, um, it's Michigan State. And it would be really interesting to uh, to see them play at this moment. But uh, as you love to point out, uh, we'll be waiting another month. <laughs> yeah, and it should have been this weekend. That would have been a lot more fun than if they play and they're 12-2. and two. It'll be a big game, but... What if they're both seven and zero playing this weekend instead of at Wisconsin? Just, it would have been a better schedule. Okay. Here's a stat <laughs> on Michigan State: they're outscoring Big Ten teams by 23 points per hundred possessions, best in the conference by a pretty wide margin. I would um, think. Michigan's at 14, Maryland's at 11, Purdue's at eight. Hmm. So, and then there, everyone else is kind of stuck down there. Um, in the around even, right. but twenty two point seven points. That's a big number, and that <laughs> just shows the how much they're really dominating right now. Yeah. And and it shows like Michigan's closer to Maryland in terms of their performance, and mm. 
Michigan's played not a very tough schedule either. So I think I don't really think there's a good argument if you're doing a Big Ten power ranking right now to put Michigan ahead of Michigan State. Agreed. Agreed. Other than the fact that Michigan State lost a couple games in November. I mean, right. in November, uh, it's just it's changed since then, and it'll probably change again. But right now, there's not really an argument, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, the fact that Michigan State gave up 92 points in that Kansas game early on, like that's one of their L's that took up. It's a completely different team. And it, it will should be a new team again as uh, mm-hmm. their roster changes with injuries and stuff. But yeah. right now, dominating the Big Ten. And I feel like sort of an underrated story nationally. Mm-hmm. But well, that could probably change here in the coming week, yeah. for better or worse, with their three-game stretch here. I think so. Three, three and six is tough. There's not a lot of those scheduling stretches left, I feel like, in the big there that was a big thing last year where they had all the tight turnarounds. Mm-hmm. But Monday, Thursday, Sunday. Whew. <laughs> yeah. That's... Against three real teams. They couldn't even have squeezed a uh you know a Northwestern in there in the middle or something like that, man. It was uh pretty rough. But all right, you had second pick and uh, I've got, who you got I've got Michigan at number two. Mm-hmm. Um obviously lost that Wisconsin if you listen to the pod, you could have uh, put a little money down and profited off that because I told you all it was going to happen. Uh, but I think they're still ahead of Maryland at this point, but not ahead of Michigan State. We've already talked about both of those teams a lot, so let's get into yeah. your next pick. Number three is uh, Maryland. They are um, – I'm not a believer, but here they are. It's a, they're clearly the third uh, team in the league right now. And uh, I'll tell you what, if, if, if they get it done, if they figure out a way to get it done tomorrow night, I will, I will, have, I will be exhausted of any reasons to, uh, to throw shade on uh, Turge. So um, there you go. I think even – I'm just really curious to see how they play. Like mm-hmm. we talked about that 30-point loss last year. I mean, are they competitive? I think there's, if, a, chance, if they're, I think there's if they're a chance they get boat raced. <laughs> yeah, there is a big chance, but if they are competitive, it kind of I think it says something about this team. Even if they lose that game, mm-hmm. it kind of speaks to whether they'll be able to hang around in the Big Ten race. If it's a game with five minutes left, that's then that's a win for them. That proves that they that proves that they are nationally relevant. You know, I agree with that. All right, next up, I've got Purdue, and I was really down on Purdue early in the year, but. Maybe those pesky computers know what they're talking about, and they were right to be ranked this high all along, even when they were 9-6 and six mm-hmm. coming off a blowout loss at Michigan State. Um, that win at Wisconsin, I think, really just turned everything around for them. Um, and if that goes a different way, who knows what happened. But now they're rocking and rolling. They just destroyed Rutgers, and then they pretty much destroyed Indiana at home in a rivalry game that didn't... Uh, really ever materialize into much most interesting thing for me about purdue is their defense was a big concern early in the year and they're still not a great defense but they're getting better and they're doing it by forcing turnovers they're forcing turnovers on 23 percent of possessions which is the best in the big 10 and something that matt painter's teams had kind of gone away from in recent years but his old teams were really kind of excelled on that ball pressure and that really forcing you into giveaways and this team has a lot of defensive weaknesses or is like personnel wise that you would probably say and it seems like maybe that's his solution to mask some of those just something to at least keep an eye on going forward Carson Edwards has taken 47 three-pointers in the last four games (laughs) I'm just looking at the numbers and that that is insane but um yeah, good week for uh, for Indiana. They are they for Purdue. I'm sorry for Purdue. Um, they got that basically got run by by Michigan State, but uh, have th- little three game uh, winning streaks on either side of that. So they've won six of the last seven. Um, you know, and Edwards Edwards does here. seem to have a little bit of his swagger going. Um, yeah, this week trip to Ohio State. And, and then that Michigan and State at home. With Michigan State, um, and if you can, that 
could basically yeah i mean that's a big stretch especially with the revenge factor of just getting roughed up i mean that game was not even as close as the final score looked at president um and it'll kind of prove i guess is this team actually as improved as it looks right now right um okay so uh number five uh while i am i'm still not buying purdue i am buying wisconsin um Last week, I think on the pod, I was saying how disappointed I was in the when on our midseason picks, I was big time buying on on the Badgers, and they just laid a couple eggs and made me look like an idiot, which is very easy to do. But uh, I thought that performance yesterday was really, really solid. It looked like the team I think you expected a little bit more of, and I think they could even play better than that. Um, you know, like you said earlier, uh, Trice goes two for ten in that game. Davidson three for six in that game, uh, and they still got the job done. But um, it is a team that is experienced, and it is a team that can can win as long as it you know does what it does well. And uh, it didn't. You know, the big step that was made yesterday for that group was not completely shitting its pants in the last three minutes of a game, which has been the uh, the biggest problem all year. I mean, they, they are, I think Ethan had said yesterday, like we feel like we should be six and zero in the big 10 because we've lost those games and he's not that wrong. So, um, I still think Maryland does have it in it or not Maryland, Wisconsin. I need some sleep, man. <laughs> Wisconsin. Um, they, uh, they need to, they need to use this win though. And, and, and go on a little bit of a, of a run here and the schedule, um, it gives them shots at Illinois and Northwestern coming up here. And then, and then it's late in the month, they get Nebraska and and Maryland. So uh, we'll, we'll see who they are later, but I think this game, I think this next two games will get them out to six and three in the league and they'll be in position to make some noise. Yeah. That's why the Michigan game, I think I said it was just such a key spot Mm -hmm. for them and it was just an obvious spot where they needed a win. Um, I don't buy into all the, Oh, they finally figured out how to win a close game. They're just, sort of a team that doesn't have the offensive firepower to blow teams out. So every game is going to be close and teams but in, lose in close those games. Losses, team... In those losses, they would commit – it would be Davidson and Trice were dribbling off their legs at the end of games. Um, and then between that and Hap's free throw shooting, like they just – they would self-destruct in the last couple minutes. I, I – I lean with Beeline. I think what he said. How did, how did they finish the games against uh, NC State and Iowa? Right. I mean, well, you got to sure you, you can just, say that about the team that. Th- I think does win. The question once in a while. here is: Is their offense going to be good enough? I think their defense is legit, just a notch behind Michigan and Michigan State in a league where there's not a lot of great defenses. But I don't know if their offense can keep pace on every night basis and that'll be when they lose it's just going to be their offense like it's going to be like that game where they score what 52 points at home against minnesota like they have a game in like that in them at any given time i think all right number six i have iowa who i projected before new year's was going to collapse (laughs) and completely fall apart and instead they have won five games in a row um (laughs) Some of that is a friendly schedule. Um, I think what we do know is that they're a different team at home. Um, they Their offense just clicks at home and they can just blow you out. Like I think I read a stat on Twitter today that their effective field goal percentage at Illinois, against Illinois at home today was above 80. I think it was, what, 83 or something stupid like that. And they made 15 of 21 threes. I mean, they're winning games, then that you got to give them credit for that. Um, but at the same time, Nebraska at home, at Northwestern, Ohio State at home, at Penn State, Illinois at home. That's not the. It, we're not printing any T-shirts here it, yet. We have to no, but it, it's also their their personnel is playing well too. Like, yeah, yeah they the schedule a little bit friendly, a little bit. but but you know, Tyler Cook is Tyler Cook, but Luca Garza has been playing really, really well, um, and, and he was even banged up as well. But in the backcourt, this Joe Weisskamp is, like, he might be on the all-freshman team at this point. I think he's getting better and better. Um, I saw, just watching some of the game today, 
Um, he's a guy who, when he's shooting confidently, uh, they they can look really, really strong. Um, I'm, what? I'm still just not buying stock until they go on the road against a good team and play any semblance of defense. Until so, they do that, I'm, I don't trust them. But at home, they'll just win shootouts, and that's, that's okay. I just think it limits their overall ceiling. Even though no one really talks about them, they are what sixteen and three or something like that. Sixteen and three and five and three in the uh, Big Ten. I mean, right now, right now they're like a five seed in the NCAA tournament. Their only their three losses are Michigan State, Wisconsin, and Purdue. I don't know. If we'll, we'll we'll we'll. There's a lot of time for some Fran McCaffrey type turns in this season, still. So. Fair. I might have just had the timing wrong in my projection. Okay. I'm just um, saying the season ends today. There are five seeds. Okay. What do you got next? Good question. I have Nebraska. Um, I don't know. I, I've, I'm done trying to figure this team out. Um, I, I was ready to – I was actually ready to write a Nebraska story. Uh, if they pulled off the win over Michigan State, I was going to go sit down with Tim Miles and do some stuff about the program and blah, blah, blah. And – didn't happen. Um, they 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 dropped the ball at the place that they never at the, the place they never lose um, on a night that would have been maybe this either the number one or number two win of the of the guy's tenure at the school and they scored sixty three points. So um, it's just they are just the epitome of the team that you know when buy it when they prove it and we're still waiting. Yeah, and they you they had all that momentum coming off the. Mm-hmm. Monday night win in Assembly Hall, and then just could not capitalize. And they really were in. There, I think they'll be in a bounce back stretch here where they have some winnable games coming up. But you want to talk numbers though? They're still twelfth in Ken Palm. They are, um, <laughs> and they're a good team. And I just, we'll see. I, I'm really curious. I guess we'll get to Indiana later. But is that win at Indiana a sign of? Good things to come for Nebraska or more bad things to come for Indiana. We'll see. I've got Minnesota next, and that is tough to do. It's tough to put the team in single digits that loses by almost 30 points at Illinois in the middle of the week, but they did bounce back with a nice win. They have a winning record in the league. I don't know that I trust Minnesota, but they've – I guess eighth is about where they go. I mean, where where do you see – you picked them fourth last week. Where do you see <laughs> them ending up? And, like, what do you, what are you buying on Minnesota right now? I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not buying Minnesota. Um, I don't know. It's like here's the thing. They, at the end of the day, they are still 14 and four. They've got wins over uh, – let's see. They've got a number of top 50 wins, Washington, Nebraska, Wisconsin. Um they are, they can be really good sometimes because they have good players. But sometimes they are so disjointed, they can just default into solo hero ball at multiple positions. Um, they're not that well coached, and that's that's going to be them. It's, it is just a frantic way of, of trying to play basketball sometimes. And... Um, they're difficult to watch, and they're for a team that can't shoot. It's hard to to go all in on, and they can't shoot. So, um, yeah, I mean, at some point though, you have to just look at the resume and say that this is what the position that they put themselves in. They're fourteen and four, and they're four and three in the Big Ten. So, right now, we can sit here and talk all the smack that we want on Minnesota, but it's also an NCAA tournament team. If the season ended today, um, so, yeah, but how you lose that game? How you lose by almost thirty? To Illinois is just beyond me. I mean, that's that's egregious. <laughs> Here's the question: How many Big Ten coaches, if you told them they could break break a deal and they could end the season today, how, oh. how many how many would take it, and how many would uh, be uh, scared of what's to come or think they could do something I positive would, in what's to come? The only ones who wouldn't are. Probably Holtman 
Underwood. That's it. Yeah, there's a lot of teams that I feel Ch- like... Chambers would want to end it just for the sake of not having just... to deal with this anymore. <laughs> uh. Uh, Pike Cole's probably like, yep, you know, this is what this is what we are. So be it. Whatever, man. Uh, and Collins, same way. You know, what's why, why go through this at this point? It's just going to end the, the same way anyway. But everyone else, oh my God, they were taking a heartbeat. All right, well, where are we at? Where are we at? We just had... Um, we just talked about Minnesota. You have Indiana next, uh, yeah. is that right? So number nine, we got uh, Indiana, a team that is <laughs> – your, your boys in Archie Island, is, the, the schedule did them no favors, and uh, riding a four-game losing streak with, with L's to Michigan, Maryland, Nebraska, Purdue, which isn't um, – with three of them coming on the road. Uh, and their offense just completely bottomed out this week. They look really – they are hard to watch right now. Offensively, 0.79 points per possession against Nebraska, 0.86 points per possession against Purdue. And that Um, Nebraska game was the only home game in this stretch. That's true. And I do think it's a schedule stretch where you're just cramming all these games in, obviously. But, man, that is not pretty. Uh, Zach McRoberts started the Purdue game. He scored his first basket of Big Ten play. And he's playing in the regular rotation. He hasn't scored in a Big Ten game before... Saturday they just that just speaks to I think how limited everything else on the roster is other than Romeo Langford and Juwan Morgan right and you're talking about a team that is still ranked fourth in the country making 58 percent of its twos but it ain't that easy in the Big Ten right like you're gonna play real Big Ten teams um that that's gonna be pretty hard to come by so I think they're shooting 52 percent in league games but you know, it just speaks to the fact that you, you, you need to be able to shoot. And what are they shooting? 31, uh, is that right? 31% on threes? Uh, they're 28% on threes in Big Ten games. I mean, there, there's no way. There's no way you can win that way. So, I don't know. And, I, and is there any sign that they're going to start falling? I'm looking at I, this. I don't think so. This schedule, though, for if you're Michigan going there on Friday, mm-hmm. that's an identical spot to where they were going to Wisconsin where it's a season saving spot for Indiana at home. And that's not going to be a great Michigan definitely definitely needs them to win that game at Northwestern that they have on Tuesday for sure. Either way though, that's going to be kind of a tricky spot. Um, what is the next? We got, uh, I have Ohio state at 10 and Ohio state is just kind of spiraling out of control ever Mm -hmm. since they lost that, Michigan State game at home. They've also lost four in a row. Um, not real impressive to lose by 14 at home to Maryland. No. On a, in a spot where you need a win. And I don't know. Their offense, and just it's not really there. And I think that speaks to they were getting by with all of those different players in non-conference play, but there's just no one they can really count on to get a basket from the perimeter and – if you don't have that, I don't know what you really have as a team. You better be pretty damn good on defense, and it turns out maybe they're not quite that good. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, they, they're also kind of the, the team that I think the tape is starting to be absorbed by the league of you know way, different ways to defend Caleb Wesson, things like that, um, that is making them a little bit, a uh, different matchup than uh, maybe they showed in um, in non-conference play. And Are they they're also they're, team? they're also turning the ball over, uh, which is really not helping anything when offense is a struggle and they're putting up some of the numbers that they're putting up now. Um, Are they an NCAA tournament team right now? They're twelve and five. With wins over Cincinnati, which feels like it was three years ago at this point, but Cincinnati, Creighton, Minnesota, I don't, I don't think they're in the NCAA tournament. Their Ken Palm projection is up to nineteen and twelve, nine and eleven in the league. That's getting dicey, I think. That ain't gonna. I don't think that's gonna get it done. I mean, they're gonna need some major wins if they're going to 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 get in with with those numbers. I don't see it happening. Um, So, am I up next? 
Yes. Yeah, Illinois uh, is coming in at number 11. Um, we, we talked about them a little bit here, but... <laughs> what a week. Score 95, give up 95. <laughs> right. Only to the max extreme there with uh, Brad Underwood, huh? Well, I tweeted it during, when I was watching the first half of the Iowa game. I mean, they had a stretch of like 10 minutes where they either took a shot within the first three seconds of the shot clock or within the last three seconds and nothing in between. Um, if they didn't score immediately, every possession was just, it was like pulling your nails out trying to watch them run offense and would inevitably end up with just a forced jack jumper um, late in the shot clock. And, you know, this is a team that's 5-13 and 13 for a reason. They're 1-6 and six in the Big Ten. Uh, I, they are they're going to bite some teams at home, and they're going to pull off a couple of upsets that are going to do some damage on some NCAA resumes, but they're just not a quality team. Go ahead. I think, <laughs> think that's pretty much it. Uh, <laughs> Northwestern is next, and they did manage to pick up a win at Rutgers this weekend, which is just what everyone wanted to spend their Friday mm-hmm. night watching, just mm-hmm. pure entertainment. Um, we had, we had it on at the bar. We did. I don't <laughs> know that – I mean, their offense is just not good enough, and I don't really see a way that that – changes going forward um though i don't know i don't have anything to add on <laughs> you got no taste on northwestern yeah uh, hard to watch 13 is rutgers um yeah i gotta think uh if i could i don't really have any takes on rutgers either rutgers for a <laughs> while was not last in efficiency margin uh that changed against purdue they're now being outscored by 19 points per 100 possessions not great and with Almarugi out, that's also not a great spot for them. He basically did almost everything for them in the front court, and that's they don't have the depth to withstand that. And then we wrap things up with Pat Chambers and Penn State, the worst offense in the league, and 0-8 in the conference. Um, I give them some credit. They play hard. They almost... Got that road win at Minnesota, but they also just can't score. No. Uh, but. But the, they have a the, week to prep for Rutgers. The coming bright, in. I was going to say, the, off the, the, the bright side is uh, they have a home game with Rutgers next Saturday, a full week off to uh, to recalibrate and see what uh, Patrick can draw up there. But uh, yeah, that, if you want to talk about a team that needs it, um, God bless them. That's gonna... And what's crazy is they're still 63rd in Kempom. Right. Well, they've won three games since November, and, and they're, they're 63rd in Kempom. They're projected to finish 5-15 and 15 in the league. So somewhere between next Saturday and March 10th, they're going to w- possibly win five Big Ten games. We'll see. Uh, that's I don't know if I'm seeing that, but uh, I think that does it. I think that's a wrap. Man. I gotta get some sleep. <laughs> but, you gotta uh, get up to uh, East Lansing tomorrow. That's right. There will be availability over at Michigan in the afternoon, and then uh, drive up to East Lansing for a for a big game at Breslin. Come back to Ann Arbor for a big game on Tuesday. Michigan, Minnesota. Michigan needs to bounce back. Um, do you want to do predictions for these two games? I would say. Give me Michigan and Michigan State to cover the Ken Palm number. What's that? 11 for Maryland. And, well, the Michigan one was big, you said, right? 14 for Michigan is a little high. Give me Minnesota with the points, but Michigan wins. All right. Uh, I think both win, Michigan and Michigan State. Uh, if we're talking the numbers, like I said, I think Michigan State might run Maryland. So I don't even know what the number is, but I'll take State to cover. Uh, and then I will take uh, Minnesota to cover the 14. I think Michigan wins handily, um, but I don't know if they run away like that. So uh, that'd be my uh, my two cents. That'll get you nowhere. So um, make sure you subscribe to the pod. Uh, leave a review if you're so kind to do so. Uh, tell your friends about it. And then uh, if you enjoy this, make sure you're also reading us. Uh, Dylan on umhoops.com. You can subscribe there and get uh, what I think is some of the best analysis that you'll find on any individual team in the league. He does a great job. Um, And I'm not just saying that because we had to uh, spend two nights on the road. 
But uh, <laughs> uh, and then when you're if you if you got a couple extra nickels left, maybe grab a subscription to the Athletic and uh, read my uh, all of my words over there. So thanks for listening. For Dylan, I'm Brendan. Uh, have a good week and. Be sure to tip your bartenders and your servers.